선교하러 갔다가 죽은 그 아버지의 피값을 복수가 아닌 정말 사랑이라는 그런 음. 용서의 방법을 택해서 아름다운 선교를 읽어낸 그런 이야기 오늘 준비가 되어 있습니다. 어, 영화라도 소개가 됐지만 그 내용을 혹시 모르시는 분들을 위해서 대략 설명을 드리면 이래요. 1956년에 미국 사회를 발칵 뒤집어 놓은 사건이 벌어지는데 미국의 그 명문 휘튼 대학교의 수석으로 졸업한 짐 엘리엇을 비롯해서 다섯 명의 크리스찬 청년들이 남미의 에콰도르 우, 어, 아우카족이죠. 네네. 아우카족에게 복음을 전하기 위해서 들어간 뒤에 실종되는 사건이 벌어집니다. 네. 그런데 나중에 우리가 접하게 된 것은 예. 그 복음을 전했다는 아름다운 이야기가 아니고 정말 모두가 다 그들에게 살해된 그런 현장을 발견하게 되는데 예. 그 당시 미국에서는 정말 언론에서 대서특비를 했었다고 그래요. 음. 이게 무슨 낭비인가. 음. 왜 이렇게 전도 유명한 청년들이 복음의 씨앗을 뿌려보기도 전에 이렇게 더 허망하게 사라져야 음. 되는가 그것 때문에 많은 얘기가 있었다고 합니다. 그런데 네. 사실 그 이야기는 여기서 끝나는 게 아니고요. 어, 시간이 지나서 이 아우카 부적은 모두 세례를 받게 됩니다. 어, 오늘 모실 주인공이 바로 그들에게 세례를 베푼 주인공이신데 그 다섯 명의 선교사가 살해됐다고 했잖아요. 네. 그 중에 한 명인 네이트 세인트의 아들 되는 스티브 세인트 선교사가 오늘 여러분과 함께 할 겁니다. 네, 귀한 선교 역사의 간증 이야기가 될것 같은데 네. 헌신이 무엇인지, 사랑이 무엇인지, 용서가 무엇인지 그걸 통해서 또 어떤 아름다운 일들이 생겨지게 되는지 영상과 특강을 통해서 많이 만나보시기 바랍니다. 5 men voyage beyond time. trying to reach them and make a friendly contact, they were all brutally killed. The uh, pictures in this magazine tell the story, and the script does as well. But the one in this story that was very, very special to me is the man who is my father, my hero. As I was a little boy, the only thing that was important to me in life was to grow up and be just like my dad. But I've written books and other people have written books about the men in this story. So what I would like to do is I would like to tell the part of the story that hasn't been told, the part about the widows, those five men's wives who have gone on to live for their faith like their five husbands died for their faith. I'd like to tell you about some of those women. One of them was very, very special to me. Her name was Marjorie Ferris. She was born in the United States, way up in the uh, state of Idaho, where she lived with her family, who were very, very poor. Now, I know this woman better than the others because she became my mother, Marge Ferris, and then she married my dad, and she took the name Saint. My mom was an amazing woman. As a young girl, her family was so poor that at one point they were living in a garage behind some other people's house. My, father, my grandfather had been a farmer, but he lost his farm in the Great Depression and he became a day laborer. What I didn't know until just before my mom died a few years ago is that
when my mother graduated from high school as the top student in her class, she and her family were living in this little garage behind somebody else's house. But my mother went on and went to nurse's training and uh, she told me that once when she was in nurse's training, she was very excited because she heard that a real live missionary was coming to the church that she attended during nurse's training. She said that that night she just couldn't wait until she got off of her duty, uh, until her classes were done. And then she ran down the road to the church because she had never met a real live missionary. And she said that night this woman began to talk about her career as a missionary living in a foreign land that my mom could only dream of. And she said when that woman was done telling her story, she gave an invitation to the entire audience and said, maybe there's somebody here tonight that God is calling to be a missionary. If you feel God calling you, would you please come down here? And she invited them to come down in front of the platform. And my mother told me that she had felt that call and she jumped up. She was way up in the upper balcony, but she ran down the circular staircase and she ran down to the front of the church and she knelt down and she said, God, I want your plan for my life at any cost. And then as my mother was telling me this as an old woman of 82, just before she died, she began to cry and tears began to come down her cheek. And she said, I had no idea what that cost would be. And then she smiled and she said, but if I had it all to do over again, I would still say, Lord, your will for my life at any cost. Well, I knew what that cost was. My mom married my dad and then they went down to live in the little country of Ecuador on the west coast of South America. My dad went down to be a, a jungle pilot, a missionary pilot flying supplies into the jungles and then flying sick Indians and missionaries out of the jungles. And um, my mom told me that God, as a little girl, had prepared her for this because when my grandfather was a day laborer, every time it would rain, my grandfather couldn't work. So my grandfather would take my mother and her brother and her sister to town. And my mother said, I learned to love rainy days, which she said was a good thing because where my parents lived down in the edge of the jungles, we got about 10 meters of rain every year. So there were lots of rain days. And it was a good thing that my mother had grown up in a poor family too because when they moved down to the jungles, for over a year, my mother and my father and my sister who had just been born lived in a little tiny tent in this rain-soaked edge of the Amazon jungle. And my mother said it was perfect. I loved living in the tent. It was just like living in the garage. And she said, and I loved rain days. But part of the cost that my mom was talking about was that after just being married for a few years, my dad heard that there was one tribe of Indians out in the jungles that he used to fly over who had never, ever had friendly contact with the rest of the world. I'm guessing Mikhail must have been around 20 years old when he first saw my father's plane. It's a guess because the Wadani don't mark time. To this day, Mikhail, he doesn't know his actual age. And my dad was concerned because in the uh, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, it says that at in the judgment day, God is going to pick uh, 
men from every tribe and nation and tongue of people, and he's going to choose them to be a royal priesthood for him. But my father thought, how could this happen if this one tribe has never heard the gospel? So my father talked to Jim Elliott and Roger Udarian and Ed McCulley and Pete Fleming, four of his missionary friends, and he said, fellas, I think that we need to go and try to make a friendly contact with these people. Now, it wasn't as easy as you might think because these people were extremely violent. Anybody that had ever tried to go into their territory, they had speared them to death. The fierceness of the Wadani tribe was legendary. More than half of all the Wadani died from the spears of other Wadani. But my dad and his friends decided that they needed some way to show these people that they wanted to be their friends. So my dad being the pilot, he devised a system where he could fly in tight circles and let a long line out of the back of the plane. And everybody every, in every country seems to understand that a present, if somebody gives you a present, it means that they want to be your friend. So my dad tied a bucket onto the end of this long line in the airplane and they would put presents in it and then my dad would fly around these villages that they didn't dare go to by land and as he flew they would let the long line out of the air back of the airplane and finally as the plane flew in circles that bucket would hang motionless in the air and then when they dropped it down it finally would come down to the ground. If there's one thing that I've learned in my life, my Redeemer is faithful and true. My Redeemer is faithful and true. And at first, the Indians were afraid and they ran out into the jungles. But pretty soon their curiosity got the best of them and they came back and they found that there were presents in the bucket, things that they really liked, machetes and, uh, and metal axe heads because these were Stone Age people. They didn't have any metal. And, oh, they, the women told me later that they loved the aluminum pots. And then, of course, women like fancy things, so they put in beads and they put in um, uh, a shirt and things like that. And you know what? The third time that they dropped these presents to the Indians, the Indians showed that they understood that this was an overture of friendship because they began taking the presents out of the bucket and then they began putting their own presents back in. In fact, this necklace that I'm wearing was made by the tribe that I'm talking about. The pig tooth signifies life and this is one of the presents that they put into the bucket. This contact 
although it started out very friendly and my dad finally landed his plane on a sandbar, two days after their first contact with three members of the tribe, one man and two women came to the beach where my father had landed his plane way out in the jungles. Gentlemen, we got company. Mira Java. Mira, Mira Java. Mira Java. As I look back on this road I've traveled I see so many times He carried me through If there's one thing that I've learned In my life My Redeemer is faithful My Redeemer is faithful and true. And they had a friendly visit during that day. And my dad and his four friends were sure that the next day they were going to go back to the village and bring lots more of the Indians. But the next day, Saturday, nobody came. So on Sunday morning, January 8th, 1956, my dad took off and flew back over the village and saw that there was nobody in the village. So then he flew back to the beach, but on the way he crossed another river and he looked down and he called my mom on the radio and he said, Marge, it looks like our neighbors are coming for the early afternoon service. They were using code language so that the oil company and the government wouldn't know that they were trying to make a friendly contact with these people. And my dad said, Marge, I'll call you back at four o'clock. But when four o'clock came, my dad didn't call. But my mom thought, well, maybe something's wrong with the radio, or maybe he just got busy and forgot. But then 5 o'clock came, and it started to get dark. And my mom knew that something was wrong. Well, the next day, uh, a friend of my dad's, who was also a pilot, flew out and flew over that little sandbar, and he saw my dad's plane there with the fabric all stripped off. And then he realized that something terrible had happened. We didn't find out for a few more days, but finally a rescue search party went in and they found out that my dad and Roger and Pete and Ed and Jim had been brutally killed. For me, that was an incredibly sad time. I just couldn't believe that my dad wasn't coming home. And I knew that it was sad for my mother, too, because I saw her crying frequently. But you know what? My mom was a woman of faith. And every night after my dad was killed, when we would get together to have our family devotions, my mother would pray for those people that had brutally killed my dad. And I realized that my mother was a hero of faith. At the same time that my mom was trying to deal with this terrible tragedy or what we thought was a tragedy. One of the other women Olive, her name was. She was just a very, very young woman. In fact, she had just come down to Ecuador to marry Pete. And um, 
Pete said that before she went to the jungle, she needed to learn the Quechua language and she needed to learn Spanish. And then finally, she was just getting ready to go live with Pete down in the jungles. They'd been married for about a year. But my dad talked Pete into going with him to reach this tribal group. And Pete was also speared with my dad. And you know, Olive told me that before, I think it was two days before Pete went, she had a dream at night. And in her dream, she saw her young husband with spears in his body. And she thought for sure when she woke up, I think Pete is going to be killed. Well, I wondered, so what did you do? Because it would have been natural, I think, for her to say to Pete, Pete, I have a bad feeling about this. Pete, I don't want you to do this. I think you might be killed. So I asked her and I said, Olive, so what did you do? And she said, so I went to be with your mother and Pete went with your dad. And he never came back. Now that showed me that Olive too was a woman of faith. Because it would have made perfect sense. And all of us would have understood if she had wanted to save her husband for herself. But this young woman at just 22 or 23 years of age had given her life to God and she wanted God to use her. So she didn't want to stand in the way of Pete fulfilling the story that God wanted to write with his life. That's an incredible story of faith. But let me tell you about one of the other women, women in this story. Her name was Barbara. Barbara was a young woman who grew up in the United States and then went with her husband Roger down to Ecuador to be missionaries. They went out to the southern jungles where they worked with a tribe called the Shuad. Now the Shuad were a special people. When they would kill their enemies, they would cut their head off and then they would peel the scalp off and they would shrink it down into what they called a sansa, a little shrunken head that they would wear on their belt or they would hang in their house so that all the other people coming to visit their house would see that they killed their enemies and that they weren't afraid. So Barbara and Roger were living with this Schwar tribe and trying to share the gospel with them when my dad talked to Roger and he said, Roger, there's a tribe of Indians out deeper in the jungles who have never heard the gospel. And so he talked Roger into joining him to go out there. Well, a story has been, the, the story of all this that I'm telling you, I've written in the book, and a movie has been made of it. When I took the group that were going to make the movie down to the Ecuadorian jungles to introduce them to the Waurani, the tribe who killed my father and and Roger and Pete and Ed and Jim. On our way out of the jungles, I heard that Barbara Udarian was actually in the edge of the jungles in the little town of Shelmeta where I had lived as a little boy. So I wanted to introduce my friends to this Barbara, this widow whose husband had been killed with my father. By the time we got out of the jungles and we went to the little house where she was living, it was already late and she had gone to sleep. But I knocked on the door and she came out and she said, who is it? And I said, Aunt Barb. She wasn't my real aunt, but I called her aunt. And I said, Aunt Barb, it's Steve Saint. And she said, oh, Steve, I'm not dressed for company. And I said, oh, Aunt Barb, I'm not company. So she put on her house coat and she came out and opened the door for me and invited me in. But what I really wanted wasn't for me to talk to her. I wanted to introduce my friends. There were about nine of them. And I said, Aunt Barb, I've got friends out in the car and I want them to meet you. So she said, well, Steve, I'm not dressed for company. I said, oh, Aunt Barb, we've just come out of the jungle, so it won't be a problem. So I went out and invited my friends and they all came in. And one of those friends said, Barbara, when I became a Christian, I read a story about your life and your husband's life and, and the five missionaries who were killed. And he said, it impacted my life deeply. He said, what impacted my life most was thinking about you young women with your families and suddenly your husbands are killed 
and what were you going to do? Your entire life had been changed. And he went through recounting to her the story that she had already lived. And then he said, this is a question that I've always wanted to ask you. And now, I hope you'll forgive me, but I want to ask you this. Now, he had just said she was a young woman, she had two children, and she was very much in love with her husband. And suddenly, they brought her husband's shoe and his watch and said, your husband has been killed. When you asked God why, what did God tell you? Well, I couldn't wait to hear her answer because her whole life had been changed by what everybody has called a tragedy. And you know what she said? She looked at Tom and she blinked. She was a little bit shy. And then she said, you know what? It never occurred to me to ask God why. I couldn't believe it. Here her whole life had just seemingly been destroyed. I know because I remember as a little boy, I thought there was nothing left to go on and live for when my dad was killed. But for a young woman who now had two children to raise by herself, to not even question God, I realized that she too was a hero of faith. You know, this story talks almost entirely about the men in this story. They died for their faith. But you know, there's an even higher call than to die for our faith, and that is to live for our faith. That's the story in the story that has never been told. There's one more hero in my life that I'd like to tell you about, my wife, Ginny. Ginny grew up in North America while I was growing up in South America, and I actually met her down in the jungles. She was with a singing group that were touring Ecuador, and they wanted to go down to the jungles. But very few people actually know the jungles. But because I had grown up there, I did. So I was their tour guide. And out in the jungles, I fell in love with this young girl from Minnesota. And then just a few years after we had been married, my aunt died, who had gone in to live with these people after my dad was killed by them. And um, when my aunt died, I went down because I had become family to these people who had killed my father. That's all in the movie and that's in the book, so I'll let you get that. But this is the thing, that when they asked me to go back and live with them again, my wife was so scared of living in the jungles that she told me later that she actually prayed and asked God to let her die so that I could marry somebody else who could live in the jungles. But you know what? God spoke to my wife and told her that he wanted her to go with me to live in the jungles. And when we did, though she had no idea how to make gardens, she didn't know how to prepare wild meat that had been speared or shot, but she went down there and she lived with those people and they learned to love her. You know, lots of Christians think that if we live our lives right, there will be no pain. But that isn't true. We can look at the stories in the Bible and we can read the stories of Christians that have been written and we see that everybody has hard chapters in their lives. The five widows that I told you about they had a terrible chapter, and I remember the devastation that I felt in my life when I was told by my mother that my dad was never coming home. But you know what? It usually is those hard chapters that God uses to make us the kind of people that he wants us to be so that we can serve him. And you know, the rest of the story I should really fill in. I told you the part about my dad and his friends being killed the devastation in my life. But you know what has resulted from that? The very man who killed my father has now become a friend of my mother's and he actually adopted me and took me into his family. And my children call him Mame Minkai, which means grandfather Minkai. The very man who killed my father adopted me and has become a grandfather to my children. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, in the movie that was made from the book I wrote, End of the Spear, in that movie, uh, which we shot down in the jungles in the country of Panama, I got to be the pilot in the story. Now, one of the terrible disappointments in my early life was that my father was going to teach me to be a pilot just like he was. That was my dream. But when he was killed, he never got a chance to teach me to fly. And I wondered if I would ever be like my dad. But when I went to college, I bought a little airplane and I learned to fly it. And then when they made the movie, they tried to get a stunt pilot from Hollywood to fly the airplane in the movie. But nobody wanted to fly that old airplane down in the jungles of Panama. So finally they came to me and I got to be the stunt pilot. We were on the set one day and I was flying overhead. You know, I told you how my dad would lower the line out of the uh, plane with the bucket. Well, we wanted to reenact that for the movie, so I was flying the plane. I had done it several days, and I looked from the sky, I looked down at this little hut down in the clearing, and I saw that there were three or four people sitting together in a little circle behind the hut, and I wondered what was going on, because the day before and the day before that when I had flown, I, nobody had been back there. So I called on the radio and I asked the director, I said, who is that sitting behind the hut? You know who it was? It was my mother and Kimo and Dewey and Minkai, three of the men who had brutally speared my dad to death, were sitting with my mother behind that little hut. And I realized only God would dare to try to write a, a story like this, a story of, of violence and tragedy at the beginning, which because God was allowed to work in these people's lives, turned into a, a story, a family story. And I got to see it happen by watching my mother sit with three warriors who, who were friends of mine, sitting with my mother while I was flying, reenacting my dad's uh, flights in the real story. But you know what? Something else happened while we were making the movie. One day, we were reenacting the scene where, we, where the Waurani buried my Aunt Rachel, who had lived with them for the last 30-some years of her life. When we buried my aunt, the people had come to me and told me that they wanted me to go back and live with them. But in the movie, we were reenacting this in great detail. And it, it was a very expensive movie. They were spending, oh, about $12,000 an hour. And it had taken them five or six hours to set this particular scene up. They had three cameras, and all the cameras were running. And they started to shoot this scene of burying my Aunt Rachel. But right in the middle of the scene, one of the Waurani warriors, who was an extra in the film, he started to pray out loud. He had his hands up. And he began to speak out loud, so it ruined the scene. Well, I was the only one that could understand what he was talking about. So I came over to see what was going on, and I realized that Dewey, this warrior who had speared my dad and later became an elder in my life, in fact, Dewey and Kimo, two of the men who killed my father, were elders in my life, and they baptized me. Now, people keep thinking that I baptized them because they think that's what missionaries do. But no, these men who had killed my father taught me how to become a God follower, and they baptized me. Well, Dewey was one of the men that had, had uh, killed my father and then baptized me, and he was standing watching this scene play out, and he was so overcome with joy that God had sent somebody to share the gospel with him that he couldn't contain it any longer. And right in the middle of the scene, he raised his hands and he started thanking Wangungi, the creator of the universe, for sending this message that had so changed his life. Well, most of the people that were there in the scene were camera people. These were people from Hollywood. These were people who weren't God followers. They weren't Christians. And they thought, that the people, the Christians, were just making this story up. But when all of a sudden in the middle of the scene they saw Dewey raise his hands, they realized that nobody had given him a cue and they knew that he, he couldn't understand their language, so he wasn't trying to impress them. And then they realized that this man's life had been transformed. And after that, I saw that many of the people started asking me spiritual questions, and they started asking my mother questions. 
because they realized that only God could make enemies into family. It's a story of reconciliation. But I think that there's a story for us in this, a story for you and a story for me. And that is that God is the great reconciler. In life, I know that you realize here in Korea there have been conflicts and there are, there are things in the newspaper every day that are, that are tragic. But God, if we follow him and if we let him write our story, the amazing thing is that he can make enemies into friends and even family. But the more amazing thing is that he can use you and me to share his message of transformation and reconciliation with the rest of the world. That's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. The Waurani, my jungle family, asked me to teach them how to do medical work and dental work and how to help people see that couldn't see. And they wanted to learn how to fly. Well, that seemed like a big task because they were in the Stone Age. But you know what? As I began to do what they asked me to do, other tribes of people began coming and saying, will you teach us too? And so now we have a small organization called the Indigenous Peoples Technology and Education Center, ITEC. And God has given me a chance to realize my father's dream. That dream that my father thought he was going to get to fulfill, God took him to heaven and has allowed me to fulfill that dream. And now I get to go around the world and teach God followers in frontier areas how to do things that my mom and my dad and these other women that I've told you about and their husbands were doing for the Indians. Now the Indians are becoming part of Christ's Great Commission. I don't know the particular role that God has for you to play, but I know that he has a role for you to play. And my prayer for you and for me is that we will fulfill God's plan for our lives and that we will let him write our stories. You know, it's amazing in the Christian life that God doesn't go out and look for heroes of the faith. You know what he does? He takes common, ordinary men and women like you and like me who are willing to have him write our stories, letting him be the author of our life story, and he takes us and he makes us heroes of the faith. I believe, no, I'm sure that God has a story that he wants to write with your life. And my challenge to you today is that you allow God to be the author of your story. Like the women in this, God can make you a hero of the faith too. And I can't wait till I get to heaven and I get to hear your story. God bless you. Thank you. I'm going to meet Nate Saint in heaven. Before, I did badly. But then we will meet again. And we'll just wrap our arms around each other and be happy. Steve Saint 선교사님의 말씀 여러분 어떻게 감동 있게 들으셨습니까? 네, 예. 역시 정말 이 예수님의 십자가의 끝은 부활의 시작이었어요. 네, 예. 어, 반대로요 사단이 주는 복수는 끝이라고 생각되는 뭐라 그럴까요? 절망감에서 오는 포기 네. 이렇게 얘기하면 되겠죠? 예, 예 그렇습니다. 네. 어, 그왜 처음에 네. 저희가 언론에서 대서 특별했었다 그랬잖아요. 이게 무슨 낭비인가. 음. 근데 정말 낭비가 아니라는 거를 많은 사람들이 나중에 알게 됐었는데요. 오늘 들으셨던 것처럼 또그 사건에서 그런 것들도 있었지만 네. 그짐 엘리어 선교사의 부인인 엘리자베트 선교사님이 네. 나중에 그 부인? 남편의 일기장을 네. 정리를 해서 책으로 만들었거든요. 거기엔 그런 글들이 쓰여 있었다고 그래요. 영원한 것을 위해서 영원한 것을 위해서 영원하지 않은 것을 버리는 건 어리석은 일이 아니다. 예, 예. 그걸 통해서 또 너무나 많은 사람들이 주님 앞으로 돌아왔다고 합니다. 그렇죠. 예. 네. 자 십자가 사건의 능력이라고 할수 있는데 여기서 사단이 
우리를 계속 건드리는 게 있어요, 사실은. 네, 네. 우리 능력 없다고 하는 거죠. 그렇죠, 거지. 그렇죠. 이미 우린 받았는데 <웃음> 네. 우리 능력 없다고 계속 우기는, 음. 우기는 거예요. 네, 네. 스티브 선교사님 하셨던 것처럼 그렇죠. 우리도 음. 주님을 믿으면 능력이 있거든요. 음. 그 능력 믿으시고 정말 많은 분들에게 영원 구원하는 그렇죠. 그런 힘을 발휘하셨으면 음. 좋겠습니다. 믿음이 힘. 네, 아멘. 네. 자, 오늘 함께해 주셔서 감사드리고요. 저희는 다음 시간에 다시 오겠습니다. 네, 안녕히 계십시오. Yeah.